Hello my beautiful friends, welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Cammie and what I like to do here on YouTube is on Mondays I talk about true crime and on Fridays I talk about scammers of the MLM brand and that is exactly what we are going to be doing today. So I've actually moved where I film because one of my roommates moved out and we have moved the whole filming setup, my computer that I edit on and everything into his room and we're currently working on getting my backdrop moved so this is kind of what we got right now to work with but my normal background will be coming soon I promise but before I actually jump into the video don't forget to hit the subscribe button don't forget to hit that like button if you like this video and after you subscribe don't forget to hit the bell button that way you will be notified every single time that I upload and without further ado Let's get into the video because this case is a weird one, okay? It's a game. It's a game. It's a game to him. Oh, <gasps> <laughs> This is my little. He's a new kitten. He's only four months old. We just got him like a week ago. Oh. <laughs> and he goes from like snuggle bug to like I have to play all the time do you hear how loud the purr is I hope you can hear it so normally I would talk about how I discovered the case but this one is one that I just found on google when I googled weird unsolved cases and this one is bizarre like I said in the intro, it's a strange case. <laughs> so first, let's talk about the Bennington Triangle. Not the Bermuda Triangle, the Bennington Triangle. So this is an area in southwestern Vermont, and it's said that as many as 10 people here disappeared between 1920 and 1950. This triangle is centered around Glastonbury Mountain, and it includes some or most of the areas of the towns immediately surrounding it, especially Bennington, Woodford, Shaftesbury, and Somerset. So Glastonbury and Somerset were once thriving towns. They were industrial and logging towns and they began to decline in the late 19th century so now they're pretty much just ghost towns. This triangle is pretty much a hot spot for some weird activity. Um, there's UFO sightings, Bigfoot sightings, all kinds of weird stuff happens out of this triangle. It kind of reminds me of um, Tracy, California, if you've ever heard of Tracy, California. Strange stories date back as far as the 19th century and Native Americans actually regarded these towns as cursed. So the Native Americans just avoided this area completely and there are tales of strange hairy men and other creatures from out of the Glastonbury area. One of the weirdest stories is the story of Paula Jean Weldon from 1946. So Paula was the eldest of four daughters of William Archibald Weldon of Stanford, Connecticut, who was a design engineer at Revere Cooper and Brass. She had three sisters, Steph, who was 14, Pamela, age 16, and Heather, who was five. She was five foot five and weighed 123 pounds and she had a grayish scar on her left knee. She also had a small scar under her left eyebrow. Now she enjoyed really outdoorsy type things like swimming, biking, skating, hiking, square dancing, and playing the guitar and she was also interested in botany. On Sunday, December 1st, 1946, Paula actually finished up her job at the Commons at Bennington College in Vermont. She worked two shifts in the dining hall and then returned to her room in the Dewey Hall dorm. And that's where she changed her clothes and told her roommate that she was going for a long hike. Her roommate remembered that Paula had said that she was feeling depressed in the few days leading up to this and Paula had actually refused to go home over the Thanksgiving break because she had gotten into a fight with her father. Paula goes out on this long hike in a red parka jacket and it had this white fur trimmed hood so what I'm imagining in my mind is probably a lot different than what 
she probably went out in. See, what I'm imagining in my mind is like one of those puffy jackets, but this was the 40s. So it was probably actually a lot different. It was probably a lot nicer. And she was also in blue jeans and white sneakers with heavy soled top siders. And they were a size six and a half or sevens. She was also wearing a small gold Elgin ladies wristwatch with a narrow black band. And this watch had a repairs marking, which said 1305 HD, and it was scratched on the inside of the back case. I don't know anything about watches. I have no idea what that means. I, but I assume it means like, if you have the watch off and you flip it over, like, not one like so you know how the watch has like the face of it and then you flip it over and it's got the back i assume it's probably engraved on the back of the watch is what i assume the back case means so she starts up this trail and she starts it at around four o'clock and she ran into this guy that she knows named ernie knapp and when she runs into him she actually asks him for directions which he gave her he also warned her, you know, don't go super far up on this trail because she only had this parka on. She didn't really have like a jacket on and it's winter in Vermont in the 40s. So, you know, <laughs> climate change hasn't hit yet. So it's still super free. I mean, it still gets really cold in Vermont, but back in the 40s, it got even colder. Yes. So back in the 40s, it got even colder. So he's warning her, you know, he's like, don't go super far up in this trail because you're not. <laughs> because you're not dressed and the sun is about to go down. I love you too, but you, <laughs> you have to go down. So when Paula left the college, it was only 50 degrees. And that's, you know, why she had only worn this parka. It's why she hadn't worn like a heavy coat. But by the time the evening came, it was much windier and the snow had gotten much heavier. So at this point, it probably, I imagine, I couldn't find exactly what the temperature was by the time that the night fell, but I imagine it's probably at least 20 degrees. But by Monday, it was about nine degrees in Bennington. So it was freezing by the time that this Monday rolled around. So wherever Paula was, it was cold. Like I said, it was nine degrees. Paula was actually seen by several students heading down towards Route 67A. So there's this guy named Danny Fager and he was at the service station across from the college entrance and he saw her walk down the drive at about 2.30 p.m. He saw her turn to her right, run up a small knoll at the college entrance, run back down, and walk down Route 67A towards Bennington. Lewis Knapp picked her up at about 2.45 p.m. and took her as far as his home on Route 9, which is about three miles from the long trail where she planned to hike. And that was about 30 minutes later after this Danny guy saw her. Then at around 4 p.m., Ernest Whitman and three friends coming out of a camp in Bickford Hollow saw Paula and that's when she asked Ernie about the length of the trail before they saw her head towards a bridge leading to the trail. Several other Woodford residents claimed to have seen her in the vicinity of Fay Fuller Camp, further up the trail, but the reliability of these reports isn't really that certain. So it starts getting dark at around 4.15 and 4.30. And after four o'clock p.m., Paula is never seen again. On Monday, December 2nd, Paula failed to show up for her classes and Mary Garrett, who is the di director of admissions, called state's attorney William Travers Jerome Jr. to the college at noon. And I feel like that is like kind of extreme. Like I'm glad that they did, but I feel like that's kind of extreme to call the state attorney for a missing student. Like, I feel like nowadays they'd just be, they would just like call the parents, but I guess in the 40s things were different. 
So at the same time, Paula's father, William, also arrived that day. They remembered that Paula had said once that she had wanted to visit the Everett Cave on Mount Anthony. So Henry Steele of Fairdale Farms was working as a guide at this Everett Cave with some of the students. And they headed to the cave that afternoon, but they couldn't find her there. They didn't find anything. So they thought they had a few possible sightings of Paula. There was this taxi driver named Abe Ruskin said, who said that he had taken a student to the bus station on Sunday afternoon, but he couldn't positively identify her as Paula. He said that there were several buses that she could have taken, Pittsfield, New York, Albany, or Burlington, and the clerks at the station didn't remember anyone of her description, but they did say that it was a busy day. So there was a waitress at the Modern Restaurant on Pleasant Street, and her name was Aura Teletier. <laughs> I know I butchered that, but her name was Aura, and she said that she served a girl that matched Paula's description at about 9.30 p.m., and she said that the girl was with a young man who was about 25 who was visibly drunk and obviously abusive. And Aura said that when the man went to the counter, that the girl signaled for Aura to come over. So when Aura went over to the girl, the girl apparently asked her how far it was to Bennington and then asked where exactly that she was. She said that she had to get to Bennington and that she had arrived in Fall River with $1,000, but that now she had nothing left from that $1,000. Aura said, quote, the girl had not been drinking but seemed dazed, so I imagine probably either she was already drunk or maybe she was under the influence of some other drug. So that evening, the media put out Paula's story and authorities in New York and Massachusetts were alerted and that's when the photographs of Paula really started to circulate to try and get her face out there so maybe possibly someone could identify her or that someone could come forward with information or possibly other sightings of Paula. So since no one knew where Paula had gone, there was no formal search and rescue effort started. On Tuesday, December 3rd, R.N. Thompson, who was the manager of the Vermont bus transit, basically he is the manager over all of the buses that go in and out of Vermont, he said that he would contact all of the bus drivers who had left Bennington on Sunday afternoon. Afternoon. <laughs> He said that he would contact all the buses who had left out of Bennington on Sunday afternoon to find out if she had boarded any of those buses. Searches were also carried out on the college campus and the section of the long trail that led to the Glastonbury Fire Station, which crosses Route 9 on the Brattleboro Road. <laughs> I think I'm saying that. That's, a, that's such an easy word to say, but I'm still like... Am I saying that right? The Brattleboro Road near Hell Hollow and Bickford Hollow. <laughs> There's a lot of hollows and a lot of two word roads <laughs> in this area. So Frank Shorn, who was the superintendent of buildings and grounds at this college that Paula went to, he basically took charge of all of the squads of the volunteers that agreed to help search on Tuesday and Wednesday for Paula. There was also this hunter who was named Herman Spencer, and usually he stays at this place called Sauceville Camp, which is about halfway to the Glastonbury Tower, and he also helped in the search for Paula. In addition to this Hunter, this Herman Spencer, and all the p other people that were helping in the search for Paula. They also had Bennington College students, Boy Scouts, about 25 Williams College students, members of the Green Mountain Club, and 30 others from the Bennington area. And then on Wednesday night, Sheriff W. Clyde Peck, who was familiar with this trail area where Paula had disappeared, joined in the search. So at 5.30 p.m. that day, Ernie Whitman, who was the night watchman at the Banner newspaper, he noticed the photograph of Paula on the front page of that day's newspaper. 
So after he sees Paula's picture on the cover of this newspaper, he actually tells reporter Pete Stevenson that he had talked to Paula at about 4 p.m. on Sunday. He and three friends, Stearns, Mary Rice, and Lyman Royce were returning from a camp when a girl approached them and asked directions to the long trail saying that she had wanted to walk along it. This girl asked them how far the trail went and they told her that they had only walked about five miles of it. But they said that they did know that it went through Canada. She thanked them and went on her way walking across a bridge which led only to the long trail. Now once he got this news, Paula's father, Frank Howe II, and Pete Stevenson drove to Woodford to begin this search. Three residents confirmed that they had seen Paula walking towards the long trail and that she was last seen near a camp called Hunter's Rest. And they, the three of these men walked towards Glastonbury and they looked about 20 feet on each side of the trail to make sure that nothing was missed. Then they continued to this camp owned by this guy named William Lawson, which was about four miles below the fire tower. But it was kind of tough to get through because below this fire tower, but like throughout this whole area, on Sunday night, they had actually, there was like three inches of snow that had fallen on Sunday night. So it was really hard to get through. So because of this, it's unlikely that she could have even reached this camp because she would have had trouble crossing the stream and she was only wearing sneakers. So the group talks to this guy that owns the camp, who says that he has not seen Paula. He also told them that he had seen these three servicemen that had passed through earlier on Sunday, and they were also not dressed for the weather. So these three servicemen were named J.W. Carroll, William Watts, and M. Golder, and they actually had never returned. William had also said that there was this deer hunter that had disappeared from his camp like a year before. So there's these three servicemen that disappeared and this deer hunter that disappeared. So again, all these people that are just disappearing in this area, it's freaking weird. What is going on in this area? All of a sudden there's this clairvoyant introduced in the story and her name is Clara Jepson. And she leads them to this covered bridge but they don't find anything in this covered bridge. So I guess the clairvoyant's not very good at her job. So authorities conclude that there must have been two girls in the area that, of the long trail on Sunday. Paula and another woman be, who was with this man that had a car. And that's what was causing this confusion between all these witnesses that were seeing someone that matched Paula's description but that was not Paula. So all these witnesses that are saying they saw this girl in this area, but nothing's coming up whenever they go search for Paula. So on Wednesday night, College President Jones issued this statement that the police suspected foul play in the disappearance of Paula. They said they also believed that whoever had anything to do with Paula's disappearance had concealed her body. They also stated that three men who spent last weekend at a camp near Glastonbury had already been questioned. John Proud of the Adams Clothes Store said he had actually sold clothes to a man on Saturday afternoon. And the man was with two other men that said that they might be going hiking. He also said that he was a student at a photographic school in New Haven. And that the man matched the description given by the Fall River Police early Thursday morning. So on December 5th, searches began at dawn in the seven square mile radius between Bald and Glastonbury Mountains. Bald Mountain. And in the search, they actually had over 125 people searching for Paula. And this search was led by Sheriff Clyde Peck. They had deployed five aircraft as well as 120 men from the state guard, meaning that nearly 500 searchers were involved in looking for Paula. That's a lot of people. I don't even know 500 people. 
A thorough search of the Blue Trail over Bald Mountain was done after a Bennington College faculty member found footprints on Wednesday afternoon that might have been made by sneakers, but no one found anything. 500 people didn't find anything that resulted from this, these marks that they thought were made from sneakers. So the search of the Long Trail was finished and authorities believe that Paula was not in that area and Paula's father said that he was happy and thought that the search was thorough and he was satisfied that it had been well conducted. There was a woodsman on the eastern slope of Glastonbury who had reported that he had thought he heard a woman screaming but they did a search of this area and found nothing. A $500 reward was being offered for any information leading to Paula being found alive but nothing was found. Some girls in Paula's residence at the college said that she had been like super happy on Saturday, which led some people to believe that she had decided to lead to a change in her life, um, which she, she was said that she was using the hike as like a diversion. On December 15th, the search was stopped, but in May of the following year when the snow melted, Paula's father organized another two-day search, but they still came up with nothing. And Paula's father actually ended up criticizing the authorities' lack of sophisticated methods in handling the case, which is what served as the catalyst for the founding of the Vermont State Police seven months later. Now, what's really interesting about this case is that Governor Ernest Gibson had actually requested help from neighboring states with the search, and Paul's father had request, had persuaded, sorry, not requested, persuaded Connecticut State Police to send detectives to Vermont to assist them in the search. Governor Gibson also further used the disappearance to shame the legislator into creating a state police. <laughs> and backers of a professional state police had pers- had Basically, backers of a state, like a professional state police, had been pushing for one for years. But legislators had voted it down pretty much every single time that one had come up. So the sheriffs were basically, they were against this because they were afraid it would make them lose their power. And Vermont's representatives really felt that there wasn't really any need to spend the money on it. And Paula's disappearance and the muddled response to it kind of made it clear that they did need the state police. I feel like, I feel like they kind of fudged how they responded to her disappearance because I feel like, well, this was back before the Amber Alert was a thing and she was an adult anyway, so she wouldn't have qualified for an Amber Alert, but I don't know, I just, I don't feel like they really handled her disappearance as well as they could have. I feel like they could have done a lot more. Like they didn't, they didn't do a formal search and rescue right when she disappeared. Cause they were like, well, we don't know where she disappeared, but you have kind of an idea of where she disappeared. You could have searched that area right whenever she was reported missing. So a lot of people think that Paula got lost on the trail, but the problem with that is that the trail is confined by a brook and hillsides. So the ground off the trail is extremely rough with rock and water. And this is why the initial search was confined to like this 20 foot area on either side of the trail. So she may have found a place off the trail to spend the night. She had done this before with one of her friends three weeks prior and so she could have done that and was planning to walk out in the morning, but maybe the weather worsened than she expected it to, is one theory. And I've also seen some people suspect a psychotic break. And it's said that she, and the reason they suspect this is because it's said that she was seen running up and down the trail before her disappearance. And she was very happy before her disappearance. And apparently, this can be a psychotic break. And it's possible that she was manic, that she did have undiagnosed bipolar disorder, 
that she did have some kind of undiagnosed mental disorder, but we don't actually have, or at least not that I could find, we don't have any evidence that she was diagnosed with any kind of mental illness. So we can't say it was a mental, it was a psychotic break because we don't have evidence that she had any mental illness that would have led to a psychotic break. You know, it's not like the Alyssa Lamb case where we do have evidence that she had a mental illness, that she was off her meds, and that it could have been a psychotic break. But we have seen, mul I've seen multiple people saying that she was showing signs of mania. So that is entirely possible, but you know, where would she have gone? It's also suspected, and this is what I think happened, it's also suspected that she was abducted either on the way to the trail or on the way back. And it's also suspected that maybe she had a boyfriend or maybe just wanted a new life for herself. But to this day, neither her body, alive or dead, nor her belongings have ever been found. And that is what makes this case so bizarre. And I want to know what y'all think. That is the case of Paula Jean Weldon. <sighs> it's a bizarre one. And it's one that I just, I think someone abducted her. I don't think, like I said, we don't have any evidence to say that she has mental illness, or at least not that I could find. This one's just so strange to me because ugh, I just, I really think she got abducted. That's what I think. But there, it's so strange. There has to be something going on in this whole area because why are so many people going missing? There has to be something that people are missing. There has to be something, if she did not get abducted, there has to be some kind of area where the rocks give way and you can easily slide down into something and get hurt. That has to be the only other logical explanation I can think of, but let me know what y'all think. Do y'all think there is a logical explanation? Do y'all think this is something paranormal? Or do y'all think it's something completely different? I want to know what your opinions are. So let me know them down in the comments below. And I will see you all in my next one. Bye!